Good evening. My name is Mary Dito Swinton, and I'm the chair of the Community Commission on Police Oversight. I want to welcome all those who are observing our meeting tonight, whether you're here in person or monitoring our meeting um, broadcast. And at this time, I call the meeting to order. This regular meeting for Monday, March 11th, and I ask the clerk to call the roll to verify presence of a quorum. Commissioner Lohr. Present. Commissioner Shanfield is absent. Commissioner Olson. Present. Commissioner Newman. Present. Commissioner Clement is absent. Commissioner Awed is absent. Commissioner Welly is absent. Commissioner Gurian Sherman. Present. Commissioner Peterson. Present. Commissioner Present. Sturm. Present. Commissioner Vorpal is absent. Commissioner Williams Johnson. Present. Commissioner Smith. Present. Vice Chair Reeves. Present. Chair Dito Swinton. Present. There are 10 members present. Shanfield. Noting the presence of Commissioner Shanfield. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We'll now proceed to our agenda. Commissioners, the agenda for this evening's meeting is before us, but before I entertain a motion on the agenda, I'd like to make a few comments. We're all aware of changes in the Civil Rights Department since our last meeting. Let me be clear, those are personnel matters which are not within the purview of this body. Therefore, we will not be discussing those matters tonight. We will, however, be receiving a report from the Mayor's Cabinet as item 4.4 on the agenda, listed as a joint presentation under the Chair's report. For those who may not know, these are the top three executives in the city's administration, and they're here to provide an update on several important issues of significant interest to all of us. You can see some highlights to be covered in that presentation on the agenda. I'm also happy to welcome new team members joining us tonight from the clerk's office. Some of you may be aware that the clerk's office staffed the Police Conduct Oversight Commission, which was the prior iteration of this body. They've agreed to take on those responsibilities for us, and I'm glad to have them with us. In working with the city staff in preparing for this meeting, we all agree that tonight would serve as sort of a reset for the CCPO. Like all of you, I have high expectations and hope, but also reserve the right to hold judgment until we have the experience. I think all of them understand that we are working for trust and shared goals. Having said that, is there a motion to adopt the agenda for the meeting as presented? So moved, Commissioner Reeves. Second, Thank you, we have a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? Yes. Hearing none. I, s I have oh, my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Go ahead. Uh, just as a, a and Sherman. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you want us to use these uh, things so that you can see better? I think I'm just going to have to keep my head on a swivel. Your <laughs> hand is big enough. I just have to do this all night, I believe. But go ahead. Uh, the, first, for missing the first thing I want to do is comment on your uh, introductory comments. That would not be part of this motion that's on the floor. I, I understand that, but so if, you you, could reserve if you're your going to make an introductory comment. Excuse me. Uh, if you're if going you, to make an introductory me. comment. No, I'm going to finish. Ex no, and you're not going to finish. I'm out excuse of me, Commissioner. I'm sorry. We have a this is a point of order. You just said we cannot discuss the civil rights director and the OPCR director's departures because it's a personnel matter. That but is But they correct. are managers, and they are not under the same purview as that is a correct, staff commissioner. Or, and if you would staff. like confirmation from our city us. attorney, I, I, I believe it's she's the happy biggest to provide upheaval that. we've had. And plus, we have two commissioners that resigned. They, Wait, are we going to just ignore what's in front of us? We are not going to discuss things that are out of our uh, out of the realm of things we need to be discussing. Those, we do to need do. to discuss we them, and my motion that. is that that be on the table. That's my first motion. I have one of two. So my motion is that as uh, things come uh, up during the course me. of this meeting, you, I'm making you a motion. You just made a motion, so we have to deal with that motion I'm, I'm first. I'm clarifying what the motion you is. You don't clarify until there's a second. I'm saying what the motion is. The motion is that during the course of the meeting, 
as discussion is going on, that we as commissioners will have a right, and because we have an obligation, uh, to be able to discuss whether or not the departures of the civil rights director and the OPCR director are impacting this reset that you're talking about and the significant accomplishments that we're going to be getting in a document that we just got point that was order. not made available to us. Thank you. And uh, I'll get the point of order in a second, but that motion would not be a proper motion because it does not that re responsibility and duty is not included in our ordinance. Therefore, we, we're not going to be discussing it. And who had the point of order? Commissioner Olson. Thank you. Just that uh, there was a motion on the agenda on the table in a second, and the discussion should be limited to that, and speeches and other comments are not appropriate. Uh, thank you. And I find that that um, point of order is well taken. I also have a, a point of order to uh, Mr. Casey Carl. Do you agree that we cannot bring up the civil rights director and the OCPR, OPCR director's departure as it relates to how this reset is going to be discussed? Thank you for your point of order, which should be directed to the chair. But I will ask uh, Mr. Clerk to respond. Madam Chair, I would defer to the city attorney on matters uh, uh, that involve the law and legal interpretation. Madam Chair and Commissioners, thank you. Um, I would concur with the chair's statements tonight. Oversight of internal city personnel matters is not among the enumerated duties, the scope of authority, or the jurisdiction of this commission. Uh, and therefore, city staff will not be answering questions at tonight's meeting. Uh, dealing with the job performance or separation from employment of directors Gillespie or Jefferson uh, nor any other current or former city employee and the inclusion of such a topic on the agenda would be in, improper and may not occur. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the motion to approve the agenda as presented? Yes. I have a motion to put public comment at the top of the agenda given the turmoil that has occurred over the last uh, two weeks. Thank you. We have a motion to move public comment to the top of the agenda. Is there a second? Hearing none, that motion fails. Is there any further discussion on the motion to approve the agenda as presented? Hearing none, we will call for a roll call vote. Commissioner Lohr. Yes. Commissioner Shanfeld. Yes. Commissioner Olson. Yes. Commissioner Newman. Commissioner Clement. Commissioner Gurian Sherman. No. Commissioner Peterson. Yes. Commissioner Sturm. Yes. Commissioner Vorpal. Yes. Commissioner Williams Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Vice Chair Reeves. Yes. Chair Dido Swinton. Yes. And Commissioner Newman is trying to respond. I'm sorry, Commissioner That's Newman. Okay. Yes, for myself, sorry, the button wasn't moving fast enough for me. There are 11 ayes and one nay. Thank you. The ayes have it in the agenda as presented is adopted. Next, we will have the acceptance of the minutes from our February 12th meeting. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? Uh, Commissioner Smith has moved to accept the minutes from February 2nd. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Olson. Thank you. It's been moved and second to accept the minutes from our February 12th meeting. Is there any discussion? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that I thought these were excellent minutes. They conveyed questions that we had. Uh, I think the uh, format for how we voted uh, was really very helpful. And uh, I think these are some of the best minutes that we've received. So I wanted to thank uh, the OPCR staff, the Civil Rights Div uh, Department staff, and anybody else who worked on these. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion about approval of the minutes from February 12th? Seeing none, uh, we'll call for the roll call vote. Commissioner Lohr. Yes. Commissioner Shanfield. Yes. Commissioner Olson. Yes. Commissioner Newman. Yes. Commissioner Gurian Sherman. Yes. Commissioner Peterson. Yes. Commissioner Sturm. Yes. Commissioner Vorpal. Yes. Commissioner Williams Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. I'm sorry, there's a new member I didn't catch. 
Or is that purple? Yeah, okay. So and then uh, Vice Chair Reeves. Yes. Chair Dido Swinton. Yes. There are 13 ayes. Thank you, and the ayes have it, so those minutes have been accepted. Thank you again. The next order of business is discussion, beginning with the chair's report. And just for your information, uh, 75 minutes for this section has been allotted to cover all of the listed items on the agenda. And I want to start, as usual, with our agreed meeting norms. And the meeting norms are listed on page two of the chair's report that is linked from our meeting agenda. I'll review those to ground us in the norms that will guide our work tonight. As it states at the bottom of the page, meeting norms are the standards for working together positively and productively as a group, and they provide a guideline for our individual and collective behavior. The meeting norms are number one, meeting materials will be shared on time. Two, suggested agenda items will be shared in advance of meetings. Number three, read any shared materials prior to the meeting. Four, participate in discussion. Five, ask questions for understanding. Six, implement time limits on presentations, discussions, etc. Seven, respect opinions of other commissioners. Eight, abide by decisions of the commission. Nine, avoid personal comments. 10, speak one at a time and when recognized. 11, be concise. 12, notify chair when a meeting or training absence is necessary. And I will just add that the meeting norms are not just for the chair to try to um, uphold and make sure everyone else is abiding by, but they are all of our collective responsibility. And so I thank you in advance for your participation in observing the meeting norms. Madam, Our, Chair, Madam Chair? Yes. May I make a quick comment? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, I am sorry for being late. Thank you for your, uh, your patience with me. This will be very quick, especially because 11 is be concise, and I will do my best. I just, as we have a very packed agenda tonight, um, it, it is important, I think, for us to underscore number four, which is participate in, in discussion. And in front of so many distinguished guests, I want to publicly thank the chair and the vice chair for all of your efforts to keep us together and to have, help us um, guide, uh, navigate us safely um, and, and through the discussion. And to my colleagues and the other commissioner, I'm grateful that you are all here tonight. These are really privileged seats that we have and each of us is here because we care about police accountability and reform. And my invitation to everyone is to think about participating in discussion to mean both stepping up to speak up as well as stepping back to let others speak up, um, especially because of their, the two resignations recently um, and people whose voices we didn't get to hear enough. Uh, I think it's really important for us to um, collectively be aware of the airtime um, and make sure that it is shared and we can hear everyone's voices. So tonight I'll keep track of participation just um, uh, overall, um, just so we can get better at what we're doing. Thank you for that. Commissioner. Uh, uh, as we've done in the past, could we have staff introduce themselves? We will do that. Thank you. And thank you for the reminder because I was going to ask for it after roll call <laughs> and I forgot. So um, if, you, if there's no objection, I would like staff to introduce themselves and tell us what it is they do for the city. Uh, Madam Chair, I suppose I can begin. Joel Fussy, I'm assigned to staff this commission from the city attorney's office. Thank you. And Janice Watts, excuse me, my voice is gone, but I am program assistant with the Civil Rights Department. Good evening, I'm Jackie Hansen. I'm an assistant city clerk. I direct the legislative support and operations division in the clerk's office. My name is Casey Carl. I have the privilege of serving as city clerk and joining you tonight as your uh, recording clerk. City Attorney. If, I yeah. believe you need to speak into the I'm microphone. Sorry, my voice is shot as well. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, City Attorney Kristen Anderson. <clears throat> Good evening. Margaret Anderson Kelleher, City Operations Officer, Interim Civil Rights Director. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carolina Amini, the Interim OPCR Director. Good evening. I am Todd Barnett. I'm the Commissioner of Community Safety. 
Thank you. Good evening, Chair. My name is Brian O'Hara. I'm the police chief. Uh, I have with me Assistant Chief Christopher Gators, uh, Commander Yolanda Wilkes, and Commander uh, Abdi Rahman Ali. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I look forward to hearing from those of you who are on the agenda. No, okay. Oh, more. Andrew Delane, Assistant City Attorney. I am on the implementation unit within the City Attorney's Office. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. The implementation team? Yes. yes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Saunders. I am the Managing Attorney of the Implementation Team with the City Attorney's Office. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Laura Mellum. I'm the Deputy COO over Communications and Engagement for the City. Good evening. It looks like you've got a whole team of us here. Uh, Jameson Whiting, City Attorney's Office, Implementation Team. I think, I think that's it this time. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, I'm excited to hear from those of you who are on our agenda. And I look forward to seeing you at future meetings of the Commission. Madam Chair, a point of order. Can, can we ask if there's anybody here from the Minnesota Department of Human Rights? Is there anyone here from the Minnesota? Good evening, my name is Michelle Manivel. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Special Projects. Good, e good evening, I'm Brielle Bernardi. I'm a Compliance Analyst for MDHR. Good evening, thank you for being here. I've enlisted help um, with the head swivel duty tonight, so hopefully I won't keep missing people. All right, next we have a proposal for the schedule of regular meetings for the rest of our year, covering the months of July through December. And if you recall from our last meeting, we had indicated a desire to have the regular meetings on Monday and Tuesdays, and we had identified some potential dates. So working with the clerk's office to put together a listing of potential meeting dates that work with City Hall's full schedule of public meetings, and the clerk's office has submitted a list of potential dates. So I'll ask the city clerk to speak to that proposed list of meeting dates for us. And it is, they are, there's a whole sheet with the dates on them. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the, in your packet, uh, following the meeting norms that you have already covered should be a listing. It's titled CCPO calendar of 2024 meeting dates. And there's a underscored line that says proposed dates on Mondays and Tuesdays. So this would cover meeting dates that are being recommended for the months of July through December. I've noted on that sheet for your reference, uh, one of the reasonings or some of the reasonings for us recommending the dates that we did. Um, we do have a number of other boards and commissions which have broadcast meetings as well. And so this is the chamber we have access to for those, so we have to be careful and judicious in our scheduling. One of the reasons why we like to pick regular meeting dates and not move them around too much. So in terms of accommodating switching between Mondays and Tuesdays, you can see we weren't successfully getting too many Tuesdays in there uh, because the Heritage Preservation Commission conducts its regular meetings, which would overlap with this body um, typically on those dates. Uh, so we have recommended Monday, July 8th. We're also uh, recommending Monday, August 5th. And I note there notes that August 6th would conflict with the regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission. And we looked out one week just in case. August 13 conflicts with the uh, state primary. We don't do uh, public facing events and meetings on the days of election days. So we could not do the 13th. We're recommending Monday, September 9. We're recommending Tuesday, October 1st, to get a Tuesday in there. The following week, October 8th, conflicts with the Heritage Preservation Commission. Monday, November 18th would be an acceptable date. The 4th conflicts with the regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission. November 5 is our state general election day. And of course, November 11th is Veterans Day, which is a recognized holiday. And then we're recommending for the final uh, regular meeting of the year, Tuesday, December 17th. Again, the December 10 date would conflict with the Heritage Preservation Commission. So given those limitations in terms of access to this space to broadcast meetings, 
we're a little bit more restricted, and hopefully in future years we could um, streamline that a bit. But those are the dates that are available that work and that we would recommend for this body to consider to fill out the calendar for regular meetings this year so that we can provide the notices and upload all of those dates for the rest of the year into the LIMS calendar for public notice. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Are there any questions about the proposed dates for regular meetings presented by the clerk? Does everybody have this sheet with the dates listed? No. Okay. It should be in your stapled agenda packet, and it's on the back side of the uh, meeting norms. So if you find Community Commission on Police Oversight Meeting Norms, on um, the next page would be CCPO calendar of 2024 meeting dates. Okay, is there a motion to adopt the schedule of regular meeting dates and times as presented? So moved. I'll make the motion. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gurian Sherman has moved to accept these dates as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, and we have a second. Is there any further discussion about these the dates that have been presented? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, I'm sorry. No, uh, we do see time I'm, I'm sorry I, I didn't I'm, hear you I'm sorry the meeting times is still the same right yes Six the time eight? will okay. stay the same All right. thank you for that question are there any other questions or comments about no okay hearing and seeing none we will take a roll call vote to approve these dates as presented Commissioner Lohr yes Commissioner Shanfield yes Commissioner Olson yes Commissioner Newman yes Commissioner Gurry and Sherman? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Sturm? Yes. Commissioner Vorpel? Yes. Commissioner Williams Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Vice Chair Reeves? Yes. Chair Dido Swinton? Yes. D did I miss anyone? I'm sorry if I did. I have 12 ayes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The ayes have it. And that schedule for regular meetings is adopted. And I'll ask the city clerk's office to post those dates for public notice on limbs and to send the meeting invitations to all commissioners to reserve those dates and times on your calendars and i think that that will be very very helpful so thank you very much next under the chair's report we have a formal introduction of the city's newly selected independent evaluator for the mdhr settlement agreement effective law enforcement for all also sometimes referred to as alifa I'd like to introduce the city attorney, Kristen Anderson, who will then make the introduction of the city's independent monitor. Commissioners, um, I am very, very pleased to be able to introduce you to a couple of the members of the independent evaluator team that we've selected to evaluate the city's compliance with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights Settlement Agreement. As you may remember, we had uh, a fulsome RFP process. We actually had 20 uh, responders. Um, we were able to do interviews and then bring three uh, of the teams uh, forward to the public to do public presentations in two different locations of the city. And uh, after all of that selection process, um, we, uh, we jointly selected with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights uh, effective law enforcement for all. Uh, again, we, we have two of the members of the team with us here today to just come and introduce themselves and just to say hello um, since they were in town. Um, Arlinda Westbrook and Chief Marianne Viverette, if I can call you both up to come and say hello. Good evening to everyone. I'm Erlinda Westbrook. With me today is former Chief Marianne Viverette. We are deputy monitors for the monitoring team. Co-lead evaluator Michael Harrison was unable to arrive in time for this meeting. Co-lead monitor David Douglas is under the weather and has been unable to join us this week. On behalf of effective law enforcement for all and the monitoring team, we are pleased to be here we are proud and excited to have been selected to monitor the implementation of the agreement between the Minnesota Department of Human Rights and the city. Even though our work has not officially begun, the selection process has proven invaluable 
in helping us begin to understand the hopes and vision of the Minneapolis community and to establish relationships that will be critical to accomplishing the agreement's goals. I'll have Chief Viveret speak now on our behalf. Good evening, commissioners. It's a real pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Marianne Viveret. I'm a retired police chief from the state of Maryland. And I will echo what Arlinda said. Our entire team is very excited about doing this work here on this important agreement. So I, I think everyone that works for Alif believes this is a calling. And we really understand how important this agreement is to everyone here in the city. So we've made three trips out here, a couple of them for interviews. And this third one, we plan, um, the contract hasn't actually been signed. It should be signed any, any day now. But we really thought it was important to keep the motivation and keep the momentum going. So we have a lot of interviews planned, um, trying to meet as many people as possible. Um, we'll get to work with the police department as soon as we actually have the contract. So that's our plan. So we're looking forward to moving forward. Um, and we want to thank you for the invitation tonight. Uh, and we hope that this uh, is just the first and we'll have the opportunity to work with you as we progress through all of the work that we have to do uh, with this agreement. So thank you very much for the invitation. And one last thing, we thought it was important um, to actually come and on our own dime for this trip. We really wanted to meet with some of our stakeholders that we had the opportunity to meet when we were here for the interview process. And we wanted to make sure that we were in close proximity to the time when we were announced to make sure that we can start listening, learning, and hearing from you about some of the things that are very, very important to this city and very important to the success of this agreement. So we're here today, we're here to listen, and we are very, very happy to get started, and we're very, very happy for the invitation. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Ms. Westbrook and Chief Viverette. As we feel we are stakeholders, we're very happy to meet you, and we look forward to our, collabor our collaboration moving forward. And as you know, this community has very high hopes and expectations. So on behalf of the CCPO, please know that we are eager to partner with you um, with respect to our work addressing police reforms in Minneapolis. I'd like to open the floor for brief comments from commissioners, but before, before I do so, let me say that we have approximately 10 minutes for any comments. This is only an introduction to Alifa, so this is not the time for in-depth questions or discussion. And having said that, are there any commissioners who have any brief comments? Commissioner. Uh, just to thank you for being here, first of all. I'm Stacy Green Sherman. I lived in uh, Maryland for 24 years, so welcome to Minnesota. Uh, I assume you'll be traveling here quite a bit, I think. Yes. Could you, I have two quick questions. Uh, one is, could you tell us what part of the consent decree, what area each of you are overseeing, and the other uh, um, uh, members who could not be here? So I, I understand that there's different, like, Portions. Could you tell us which ones that you're overseeing? Yes, I'm um, co-lead over community engagement along with David Douglas, and I also will be um, working on um, accountability and oversight. And I have um, main responsibility for stop, search, and arrest, and I'll be helping out with the accountability, the internal affairs intake. Then we have Bill Murphy, he's a retired deputy chief from LAPD, he'll be working on the academy. We have a data person, Eric Melanson, and then we have a policy person, Lisa Fink. Um, and then pretty much everyone on our team has been exposed to this for a long time, so we'll be, all be able to help each other when we get into the various areas. Uh, and the main person is John Salomon, who we thought important from lessons learned that we had a project manager to um, manage this project. So he will um, serve as the project manager for the entire project. So what will the role of um, uh, uh, Chief uh, Michael Harrison be? Chief Harrison, along with David Douglas, are co-leads of the uh, minor team. So of course they will, Chief Harrison will work closely with um, the police department, of course, and we'll work um, very closely with all aspects of all of our different areas as co-lead along with David Douglas. 
And then one quick question. Could you identify in the room the people that are here from the implementation team and the uh, police department that you'll be working with on the consent decree? I know that Lieutenant Wilkes is here, and um, it would just be good to kind of uh, get names and faces and how they all fit together. We're, we're just aware of, um, of course, the lieutenant and, of course, the chief and the um, city attorney and the members of the um, implementation team for the city. But, of course, also the Human Rights Division um, we've met with and we'll be working with them very closely. We're really here to work with everybody and to have we, – we pride ourselves on having everyone sit at the table and make sure that we have – um, a good working relationship, but as we announced earlier, we have not formally signed contracts, so we have not formally been introduced to our liaisons for each um, different unit. Um, we will be back here um, the week of the 25th, and I think we'll have more formalized meetings then where we'll meet the actual um, individuals that are assigned to the different areas that we'll be working with closely. Thank you very much. You're we, are you staying for the rest of the meeting? Yes, I'll okay, be great. here um, for the rest of the meeting, and I'll be here through Thursday. Great, because we have a community engagement team with a report that I think will be of uh, great interest. Absolutely. We're just here to listen, and we will be here the entire meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from commissioners or brief comments? Oh, yes. Commissioner. Mike. Uh, good evening. I'm Lewis Smith. One question I would have is either uh, you could answer tonight or perhaps in a subsequent meeting and conversation. What, in your experience, have been the elements of a success for citizen oversight commissions such as ours in this process? <laughs> no pressure. I think that's a good one for a later um, um, conversation, um, just to have some better understanding of your inner workings and um, how well you work. We've, we've been exposed to other cities and um, some of the challenges that they've had and some of the successes. Um, but our job is to learn Minneapolis and, and Minnesota and see exactly what um, you have um, implemented and make whatever recommendations, but it'll probably be better for a later meeting. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Reeves. Uh, thank you. I look forward to working with you all. The first plus that I say is you said Minneapolis correctly. A lot of people don't say Minneapolis correctly, so I'll just throw that out there. Uh, so I just want to say I thank you, and I look forward to working with you. Well, I'm you. accustomed to people saying New Orleans incorrectly, so mm -hmm. I made sure that I can. Exactly. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Newman. Yeah, no, my just question was regarding the contract. Um, do you, when do you anticipate on having that um, completed, or is there a date already in place? I think the city attorney may be better to answer that. I'm not sure from our end if we have any um, specified time, but we're so committed to this, we didn't really need a contract to start working. We want to we wanna get going, and um, so we're here, but I think I'll. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, again, I'm Jennifer Saunders. I'm the managing attorney of the implementation team with the city attorney's office. And we are working through the procurement process. Uh, the council approved the contract last Thursday. That council action was published on Saturday. Uh, we are now just making sure we have all the documents we need um, to formally sign the contract that should be happening this week. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Seeing no additional questions, I do have a question. Um, is it possible, and maybe we would wait until after the contract is signed, but is it possible for us to receive an org chart maybe so that we could see names and areas of responsibility and have something to refer to? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And does that need to come after the contract is signed, or may I remind you tomorrow? You can remind <laughs> me tomorrow, but we will. Okay. We will, I will. Um, make contact with um, David as soon as we're finished, send him a text since he decided to be sick on us and he can start working on getting that to you okay. right away. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And sorry, David, for giving you some extra work. <laughs> we, we really appreciate you being here tonight and we do, um, we are looking forward to partnering with you in your work and, and, and helping in whatever way we can. So thank you again for being here tonight. Yes, thank you.
Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. I'd just like to thank the city for what was a fair, open, transparent process. Uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, mechanisms that were required in the consent decree about how to go about the process of selecting uh, the independent evaluator. They were all marked off, um, but not just to mark them off, to make sure there was a fair, transparent, and public engaged process. I think it's a model for how the city can, go, can engage uh, contracts and uh, do these kind of implementations so that the public really feels that it had a part in the decision making. So thank you to the city for that. And I'm going to echo that. I think you're a model for the country in terms of your processes, how you um, have engaged your communities. Um, one of the things that we're trying to improve upon, even in New Orleans, is doing that more. And so we are honored and humbled to be a part of this process, and we believe this will be a model for many cities um, to come. Thank you for that. And again, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. All righty. Next, we have the major focus of tonight's meeting, which is a joint report from the mayor's cabinet. The city operations officer, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, community safety commissioner, Todd Barnett, and city attorney, Kristen Anderson. I'll just tee up that this presentation will cover a number of issues, which include those shown on the agenda, which are a review of our enabling legislation and how that interacts with the city's settlement agreement with the Minnesota Human Rights Department, an introduction of our interim director of the Office of Police Conduct Review, Carolina Amini, a discussion of interim and long-range plans by the city administration to support the CCPO in its work and finally, an update on plans to provide the training mandated in our enabling legislation to all commissioners. Madam Chair. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. I just want to make sure the presentation will be online. We tried to make sure every commissioner had a copy of that presentation. Really quick, can I make sure that everybody has a copy of the slideshow? Just to make sure that we don't need any extras. All right, thank you. Sorry. Thank you for that. Um, with that, I'll recognize Ms. Anderson Kelleher for the joint presentation, and I'd like to have commissioners hold any questions or comments until we've completed the presentation. Ms. Anderson Kelleher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. Um, those of you who know me know my voice is a little lower. I also had whatever this thing is that's going around, and so I apologize if um, the voice is not quite where it's supposed to be tonight. I first want to thank you all. I want to thank you for your public service. This is public service. And we appreciate that you were willing to say yes, that you were selected for this role, these roles, as CCPO. <clears throat> Tonight, we are going to hopefully provide information both about process, practice, as well as information that you all need to continue to do your work. So I will uh, start with our very brief agenda, not really all that brief, um, a little bit about the Civil Rights Department updates, a review of the role of the CCPO through the MDHR settlement process and agreement. We also are going to cover a number of things related to your work, the CCPO status report and a look ahead. Cases. Uh, where the status of cases are today, the staffing levels, review panels, external assistance that is being provided to the OPCR and IA staff, as well as uh, additional help and support for the CCPO, dashboards and the update of the dashboards and some projections on how that is going to both look and how quickly the administration of this process, as well as then, of course, the commission application period for those of you who have terms that expire at the end of May. This has been a joint effort, I want to say, in being able to provide this information. You'll be hearing mainly from myself, um, as well as the Commissioner of Community Safety and our city attorney. But I also want to mention that the clerk's office has provided very important support to the work that we've done here. 
The civil rights position is open right now. I believe it closes at midnight tonight, and we've had many applications. And so I do not desire to remain in the role of interim civil rights director for any longer than I need to. And so I will, we will be working together with the mayor to make an appointment recommendation. Many of you know Carolina Amini, who had worked in this office before, is going to serve as the interim director of the Office of Police Conduct Review for a period of time. That will coincide with a review of the OPCR director position description, which needs a bunch of work and uh, going through that process right now. I'm sorry, could you just repeat that last sentence? I just didn't hear it. So, it needs, something needs a lot of work? Mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, the OPCR director position description oh, I see. Thank needs you. an update. And so we're going through that process with our HR department as well as uh, some reach out, uh, particularly to Nicole and the resources that they could provide me about similar types of positions to make sure that we are uh, scoping that position correctly. Thank you, I'm sorry to interrupt, I just didn't hear. All right, I'm going to first turn this over to the city attorney, Kristen Anderson, for a bit about process and uh, as well as a few other items. So commissioners, uh, I wanted to give you sort of a grounding of how your work intersects with this Minnesota Department of Human Rights Settlement Agreement that you've heard us talking so much about. So the settlement agreement itself um, does actually call for the city to have a community oversight commission to provide meaningful public participatory independent oversight of the MPD. And it sets out a few different ways in which this oversight body which happens to be you, um, should be um, uh, fulfilling those responsibilities. One is hosting regularly scheduled meetings with comments from the public, which you are doing. Um, also, collecting, reviewing, and analyzing summary data, which is requested uh, by you within your jurisdiction, um, is not, doesn't include privileged information and also doesn't include non-public information under the Data Practices Act. Um, there is a provision that's, that provides that um, if the city feels that the uh, data requests or the information <laughs> requests are, are unduly burdensome, what's supposed to happen is there's supposed to be a communication between this body and city staff to sort of work it out um, so, that, um, so that the requests are such that city staff can, can actually uh, get them accomplished. The second thing that the settlement agreement talks about is um, that the city will develop an out outreach strategy for um, identifying individuals to um, serve on this commission um, and to ensure that the commission is um, filled with a diverse group of members representing a cross-section of the Minneapolis community. And that was done with your appointments and um, COO Anderson Kelleher will talk to you a little bit more about what the process is going to be looking like, like to, um, to uh, identify uh, members or take applications for those of you who are uh, coming to the ends of your terms. And then the third thing that's in the settlement agreement specific to this body is that the city will require that the Office of Police Conduct Review provide sufficient staff support to provide the Community Oversight Commission with meaningful particip participatory oversight. So those are the, the, the items that specifically address this body in the settlement agreement, but of course this body has another role. Um, and that is a really, really important role, and that is serving on the review panel. So I thought that I would take a, a moment to just really track through for this body exactly what the accountability system of investigation, review panel, discipline looks like under the settlement agreement and how this body plugs in. So I think it's important maybe to go a little bit backwards in time. Um, prior to the Human Rights Department um, settlement agreement, we had a structure in place in Minneapolis um, that, that had, by design, many touch points by MPD sworn officials. 
This was done because the, the system that existed even before that, um, officers felt that it was um, biased in, in, uh, against the police and, and there was just not buy-in um, by the officers in that system. So through the investigation, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights found that the, sw the system had swung, the pendulum had swung a little bit too much in the opposite direction, and that um, almost every investigation was assessed or guided by sworn MPD officers. And probably the primary focus of the investigation kind of pointing to the, the uh, sort of too much involvement by sworn officers was in a joint supervisor process, which essentially had the director of the Office of Police Conduct Review and the commander of IA making joint decisions about whether a complaint would get investigated um, or not, um, and, and how to investigate it. Uh, they were, there were still separate investigatory units, but there was this joint supervisor structure that had kind of this joint decision making between both the Office of Police Conduct Review and Internal Affairs. And um, MDHR found that that was problematic and one of the, the key things that the, uh, the settlement agreement does is abolishes that joint supervisor process so that doesn't exist anymore. Um, the other uh, aspect of the prior system was that the panel um, that the investigations went to was a four-person panel. So it was tied to sworn supervisors and two civilians, and the f civilians were uh, a person appointed by the mayor and a person appointed by the, the council. So the MDHR investigation found that you know when there's two to two, um, there's a, a, a problem there. So another big feature of what we agree to with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights is that the review panels are now, as you know, five-person panels, three civilians, two sworns. Um, so again, uh, in the, the settlement agreement, we agreed to eliminate that joint supervisor structure and really put in, into place the structure that we have now that I've, you know, in my, my poor PowerPoint skills, it's not a very pretty uh, graphic, but I think it kind of tells the story. So there are internal complaints, and internal complaints, um, generally speaking, go to internal affairs. Uh, external complaints, citizen complaints, go to the Office of Police Conduct Review. When I say generally, there, there are really two caveats. Um, one is that when internal complaints involve the anti-discrimination retaliation policy, those are still investigated by human resources. That's part of the settlement agreement. They have the expertise in that policy, and so they are still doing those investigations. And then the other caveat is there are some circumstances where, where an event will happen and we will have a complaint made by both citizens and uh, by, uh, by uh, internal employees, and in that situation, other than for critical incidents, which are always uh, investigated by internal affairs, in those situations, um, it's really first, first filed. So if the citizen complaint comes in first and then there's also internal complaints, then that would go to the Office of Police Conduct Review for investigation, um, and the reverse would go to internal affairs. But either way, these two investigatory streams wind up um, at the review panel. Um, as I said before, the re review panel now is a five-person panel, three civilians, two sworn, um, and this is really where your work plugs into this whole process. Um, one of the findings of uh, the Minnesota P Department of Human Rights investigation was that the prior body um, didn't have a lot of touch points with kind of the work of MPD and sort of knowing what sort of disciplinary issues were going on. And so what we devised here was to be able to, um, you know, we've got that Data Practices Act, which does make things a little bit difficult in terms of, of communicating uh, data to an entire body. But what we've been able to do by having you serve on the review panels, because you are part of that process, you have a, a business need and we can share that non-public data with you when you're serving on the re review panel. So we get, um, your expertise, your insight, and also your learning in the process, what issues are coming up for MPD, and you can then take that information, not that you can disclose it publicly, you can't, but that knowledge and that learning that you're doing on those review panels can help educate you as policymakers. Um, 
So, so that's where you plug in, and then, of course, some of you have been on review panels, and you know that what you're doing is making a recommendation as to merit or no merit, and then a recommendation as to discipline, and then that goes to the chief. Just briefly, I wanted to also talk to you about timelines. These are timeframes that are built into the settlement agreement. Um, they are very vigorous timelines. We are not there yet. We are building up um, to a point that we can actually comply with all of these deadlines, but I want you to be aware of what they are. So under the, the settlement agreement, complaint comes in. Um, there's 30 days allotted for kind of the intake process, and that can be you know, uh, doing preliminary interviews, it can be reviewing body-worn camera footage, it can be um, dismissing cases, and the Human Rights Settlement Agreement identifies specific um, circumstances under with which a complaint can be dismissed, or it could be referred um, for, for mediation or, or some other disposition. Um, assuming that an investigation is determined um, to need to occur, then the investigation under the settlement agreement should be completed within 180 days from receipt of the complaint. And then once that investigation report is complete, it goes to the supervisor for review. The supervisor has 15 days um, to review the investigation summary report and key aspects of evidence. And they can, at that point, decide, you know, this is, this is not complete. We need more evidence and send it back for further investigation. But if everything's OK, then the supervisor has to um, send that uh, summary report onwards um, to review panel and the review panel uh, has to occur within 30 days after the supervisor okays the investigation report. Uh, again, the review panel um, uh, recommends merit or no merit, discipline uh, or no discipline, uh, and what type of discipline. And then um, after the panel occurs, the panel has a chair Three days, uh, within three days, the panel chair has to provide that recommendation form to the Office of Police Conduct Review. Um, and within seven days of that, OPCR must provide that recommendation and the file to the chief. The chief has 15 days to review the file to determine whether to move forward or to remand because the chief thinks that there is not sufficient information or thinks that certain things need to be um, more uh, robustly investigated. But if there's not a remand, then the chief is to make a decision within 30 days of getting that um, file from OPCR. So those are the deadlines that are set forth in the agreement um, and that eventually we will need to be compliant with. Thank you to the city attorney. Um, just give me a second as I get caught up on my book. I want to first thank the staff of OPCR. They are very hardworking staff. They have been doing a lot. And I know that Ms. Amini becoming the interim director is going to help that work improve even further. And I do want to share with you where we are at today. I'll be sharing both the OPCR and internal affairs numbers, and then uh, we will go from there and have some more discussion of both staffing levels of OPCR and IA and the budget. So cases in intake. Currently, OPCR has 149 cases that are in the intake phase. The median age of those cases is 172 days. The oldest case is 449 days. Internal Affairs and MPD has 43 cases sitting in intake. Median age of those, 44 days. The longest sitting there is 237. I think you are all aware we have been in a process of changing over systems. We are now using the system of Axon standards to track these cases, the investigations, and the information surrounding them. However, uh, up until last year, we used uh, what we call the legacy system, which is practice manager PM. There are still 25 cases sitting in that legacy system. 
with a median age of 966 days and the oldest case of 1,793 days. When those cases are cleared out of that legacy system, we will no longer be using that legacy system, but they are there today. So that is a total in case intake, and that is the 30-day uh, uh, agreement with MDHR, 217 total cases are currently sitting in intake. I'm sorry, could you repeat that last number? 217 cases are sitting in intake. Cases in investigation. I'm just going to move my book over so that I can read it and don't have to read the slide so much. So here, and I'll start with the total, uh, there are 125 cases sitting in investigation today. OPCR has 26 of those cases, and these are breakdowns of those subset of numbers. 14 are assigned to an investigator, 12 are unassigned. IA has 56 cases in investigation currently, 41 of the 56 are assigned to an investigator, 15 are unassigned. There are 43 legacy cases, 41 of those do have an investigator, two do not. You can see that there is a range of median age of these cases. I'm going to read the top line of these for you, but there's detailed breakout for where assigned or unassigned to an investigator. OPCR's median age is 221 days and a half. The oldest case is 346 days old. IA's median days right now, 266 days. And if you have a printed version, there was an error in the first printing of this. IA's oldest case days for both IA and assigned to IA investigator is 431 days. In the legacy uh, category, this is in PM, practice manager, again, the median days 654 days, and the oldest case, 1,214 days. I'm going to go to the next slide, and then I'm going to give you a total of all cases. So then we move to the supervisor review process. In OPCR, there are seven cases sitting in the supervisor review process currently. And there are zero cases sitting in the IA supervisor review process. The median age of the cases in the seven cases in OPCR, 262 days. So that tells you that we have a total um, between intake, investigations, and supervisor review of 349 cases. Okay. I'm going to have the Commissioner of Community Safety come up uh, to talk a little bit about the panel review and the Chief's review. All this talk briefly here, uh, and you can see it on the slide uh, here, and you should have it in your packet. Uh, there's been 17 uh, total panels, and you heard uh, City Attorney Anderson talk about how those panels are formed. Uh, as you can see uh, from those panels, uh, 11 were for merit and six were for no merit. And then when you look at the Chief's decision, um, I think what you'll see and probably wonder about is that there's only four cases pending for the chief's decision. And so the rest of those cases have been taken care of from the 17 panels. Thank you. I, I know I've asked commissioners to wait until the end, but can you just clarify 17 total panels and what are the dates since when? Thank you. September. 
September of 2023. Thank you. Okay. So on OPCR staffing, uh, as I mentioned, <clears throat> sorry, I might have to get a drink of water. Um, oh, hold on, just, I have a cough drop, sorry. I don't, oh, normally I'm like, no gum, no cough drops while speaking, but I have to tonight, I'm sorry about that. Um, Ms. Amini will be serving as the interim director of OPCR. You will be having an update from her later on. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the 2024 budget includes another additional three investigator positions, totaling 11. I just want to give you a bit of that history. From 2021, there were six case investigators in the old office uh, before it became OPCR. Thank you, Casey. And then there were additional six staff members as well, totaling 12. You can see through the table that we get to 2024, where we now have 11 investigators on staff at OPCR. We're in the process of hiring a couple more right at this moment. And uh, we've kind of stayed steady with the other staff number, six or seven throughout this period of time. So 17 total staff. The budget has often been talked about, whether the OPCR budget is supportive of this work. So back in 2019, the OPCR budget was a little under a million dollars. In 2024, it is $2,269,000, a more than doubling of the budget. And that is not taking into account other supports, the pro bono legal work, the outside investigator contract, this is the budget within civil rights OPCR. I'm gonna have the commissioner come up and talk about the, both the IA staffing and budget. Talk a little bit uh, about internal affairs staffing. Uh, what you can see uh, and I'll just talk about the total numbers because the other numbers stayed about the same uh, when you look at lieutenants and sworn officers. Um, but what you'll also see is an increase in the civilian investigators. But uh, you can see in um, 2021, there were six total staff members there. Uh, you might wonder why. That wasn't always the case. 2019, if you go back, and this will be significant to the next slide, but in 2019, the total staff was 10. Uh, and so, as most of you know, um, in 2020, uh, all around the country, uh, a lot of law enforcement uh, officers uh, left the field. Uh, and so you'll see that here as well and you'll notice in the next slide that Chief O'Hare has really done a great job at getting the staff back up to where they are now and that's 11. So that's back up to that 2019 uh, number, just actually one over that. Um, and so you see that there. When you look at the budget, you can see that that budget kind of flows with the number of people. Um, and that's why I brought up 2019, because you can see that budget's over uh, $2 million. You see it dip down uh, in 2020, uh, 2021, 2022. And as the staff number has gone up in 2023 and 2024, you'll see that the, our budget in internal affairs has gone up. And when you look at this slide, it's all really about the salaries for staff and the fringe benefits. So you see that sort of U-shape uh, for the budget. Thank you. Uh, I'll just briefly talk about the external assistance that we've had. So um, Jones Day Law Firm has um, very graciously agreed to uh, do investigations for us for, for free. Uh, it's, it's pro bono assistance, um, and they've completed 23 investigations thus far, and they have 19 of our investigations uh, that they continue to work, work on today. Um, we also um, have uh, put out an RFP for 
uh, external investigative assistance, not for free this time. Um, and um, the, really the purpose is to kind of get the capacity there to make our way through that backlog that, that um, uh, COO Anderson Keller has talked about. Um, so it a, a, a would be a contract that would give capacity for up to 120 investigations per year. It's one of those contracts that, that we don't have to use it, but we have the ability to use it for, for up to 120 investigations per year. Um, it went before council last cycle, and there were st still some um, factual questions that they needed to answer, so they delayed that one cycle. Madam Chair and Commissioners, I know training has been on your minds. I uh, have listened, I listened to the last meeting, I listened back. Uh, this has been a topic that has been ongoing. And so I wanna share with you that the city has reached out to NACOL. Some of you have attended their conference. Um, they are putting together a training plan for us. The National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement is the premier organization in the country for helping commissioners like yourselves. And they are putting together a training plan that will include both on-site in Minneapolis and hybrid for all of you, meaning specifically for CCPO, but it may take place over uh, Teams or Zoom so that you are all able to ask questions and uh, work through scenarios. We met with them about 10 days ago and we await their proposal to us both for a short-term training plan as well as a longer-term training plan. And uh, I'm excited about this work. I think they seem like the right group to be assisting us in this. We also have been able to already get a use of force training scheduled. I know that's been something that many of you need. And that is coming up on April 16th, 2024. Uh, more details will be coming about that. All right, and the future of the dashboards. So on the screen and on your slide, you will see on the right a mock-up of what we believe a dashboard could look like for OPCR CCPO. And that is a dashboard that very much uh, responds like the Labor Standards Board information on the Civil Rights Department. So if you've ever gone on, and I'd encourage you to do this, if you go to the Labor Standards work on the civil, in the Civil Rights Department, it is a responsive dashboard. So when you click any one of those buttons, those buttons will take you to the deeper information and will lead you to that uh, specific information and be able to be updated in real time. The visualization will then link to these dashboards. We think this is important. It will be smartphone friendly um, because it's so important. Most community members do have a smartphone, but a, la you know, a, a desktop computer Many people do not have that as access. And so it'll be responsive to that. We are in the process of working on this right now. We, uh, we are still going to be updating the current public dashboards and working towards getting this responsive visualization dashboard done in the next uh, six to eight weeks. We're working on it already with the IT department. And then uh, finally, I wanna talk about the support uh, for all of you. So first of all, the OPCR staff remains dedicated to supporting you. They will be providing the professional, technical, and general operational support on any given day. The clerk's office, you've met Mr. Carl and Ms. Hansen this evening, 
will be providing uh, the work with the chair and vice chair to develop those agendas, to be able to provide the meeting management support, such as room scheduling and things like that. And then also handling the important functions, clerical functions that the clerk's office handles because as our clerk says, if it doesn't happen in the room, it doesn't happen at all. And so the recording of the meeting, the recording of the minutes, the recording of the important files that you have a need are going to be handled by the clerk's office going forward. And then finally, the city attorney's office will continue to provide legal consultation and advice as well. Finally, I understand some of you have terms that are up. This is a new board. We are getting ourselves to three-year terms, but to get there, uh, there has to be a process to stagger those terms. And so you're seeing here on the screen that there are terms that end as of May 31st of this year. The application process, I believe, is open as of today. And so you, if you are looking to reapply, please reapply. It's also open to the public for those folks who are interested in applying as well for these positions. People will serve until new appointments are made. This is a board where you will serve until the new appointment is made. So if there's anything delayed in the process, you will all be continuing to serve. Um, but you can see here uh, wards 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, 13, uh, and one of the mayor's representatives will be up for appointment. We stand for questions. Madam Chair. All righty, thank you. And I, let me just say I can share personally that I have been very impressed with the interactions that I've had with our city's executives and their expressed commitments to the CCPO and its work. And I do remain hopeful that we can move forward together aligned around this shared vision. And with that, I will open the floor for questions or comments from commissioners. And I heard one. Yes, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Kelleher, Commissioner Barnett, Ms. Anderson, thank you very, very much. You probably are all aware that last meeting, the Commission adopted a resolution asking for information, most of which you have brought forward. Um, it's really the first time, I think, in our history as a Commission that we've had this much information shared with us about the existence of the backlog, where it sits in the process. And I think it's fair to say that everyone in this room inherited this backlog. Nobody in this room created it. But it's stunning. It, it's incredible that there are so many people in the city of Minneapolis waiting for justice, having complained about police conduct. So I know we are already uh, within uh, our abilities to, to serve. I, I've served on one panel, and I, I don't think I'm alone in in that. So we are eager to get to work and we're grateful for this information, but I think we still want to see a plan mm -hmm. for how this backlog will be attacked. And I, I'm not asking you to present it tonight, but um, thank you for responding to our resolution and, and bringing forward this information. So Madam Chair, Commissioners, if I could, I know Ms. Amini is working on that plan, but I do want to share, it took me a while to find out some basic information um, I, I'm a heart and head person. I'm doing this work because I believe deeply in public service and justice for people. But I also know we need to understand how we're going to get there. And so one of the pieces of data that I've been able to find, and that was actually through talking with the folks at Jones Day who managed those 23 cases, the average uh, investigation time is taking about 55 person hours. The longest cases take somewhere around 120 person hours of those 23 cases. The shortest time has been 25 hours. We're going to at least use that as part of our information going in to working on the backlog and the investigations. Thank you. Are there other 
Commissioner Gary and Sherman. Thank you. I, I echo uh, the, the comments. Um, I'm disappointed uh, to get this information 10 months in. I'm disappointed to get it uh, after we've started doing review panels. And I think most of the public doesn't understand. That's only half of what we do. The other half is being stewards of making sure all of the mandates and powers that we have for reviewing, researching, and making recommendations is done. So we are actually two entities in one, a commission that uh, evaluates policy, and we haven't really even started doing that work uh, except in the work groups, and uh, then we have the police review. So we're doing twice as much as any other entity in the city uh, for, as volunteers. Uh, it puts us at a great disadvantage. I note in the PowerPoint presentation about the timelines, there's nothing new in that. That's in the consent decree. Why wasn't that part of the training? And one of the things I asked for in the last meeting uh, that we're supposed to get responses to today is what about trainings that help us understand the information we're getting? So hopefully that will be part of NACLA because those of us who are, have been doing the review panels have been talking not about the cases, just about our experiences. And some of the documents we're not familiar with. The two sworn officers are very familiar with them. So they have an advantage over us. It's not to say it's a, a bad advantage, it's just that we're not able to read things as quickly as they, we don't know really what we're looking for. And of course, the more panels you do, the more you get it. It's like anything else, like riding a bicycle. Uh, I actually wanna drill down on the uh, external assistance. Um, I think what you mean is an external investigator. And um, you know, one of the things I noted, I went back and read the MDHR consent decree before I came to this meeting. It's just amazing how much more information you understand when you've gone through the process. And one of the uh, statements is, uh, the city's accountability and oversight policies and procedures must comply with all applicable laws and this agreement and promote trust between MPD, the city, and the communities they serve. It's wonderful language. I did not see one thing in the consent decree, one thing in the CCP ordinance that authorizes external investigators. I'm very concerned about that. We have, if, with the external investigators, we have OPCR, we have internal affairs, an external investigator. I have much more confidence in the police department's IA investigations and OPCRs because there are procedures built in, standard operating procedures. We have no idea who Jones Day is giving uh, their cases to. We have no feedback uh, on how, uh, if that 50 hours that they're, they're taking is what it, it takes for OPCR. I also note uh, in other documents, uh, I have time to and I go to city council meetings. It's my understanding that internal affairs is going to get maybe up to more than 20 more investigators. So if there's a backlog and legacy cases that, and these cases would normally go to OPCR, then there's really no reason that they can't go to uh, IA uh, investigators to clear up the backlog. And I also want to comment, Jones Day is not a pro bono provider. I think that's really disingenuous. They may be providing pro bono services here, but they've gotten millions of dollars from this city. Uh, they were helping you all to uh, negotiate the consent decree with MDHR and actually pushing back on a lot of things. So to say that they're a pro bono provider when they've used that as a way to sneak in and get contracts, I find that very disturbing. I also find it disturbing that you didn't talk about the money for the Wiley Reber Law Firm. One million dollars when nothing has been shown to the public or to this commission that we need external investigators, that they have the same standard operating procedures. And I have a problem with the Wiley Reber firm. Greg Wiley, who's one of the two attorneys, is a paid lead negotiator for the city on the, on the contract team for the police contract. How in the world is there not a conflict of interest between that law firm getting this contract. They're o the opposite of Jones Day. So instead of doing pro bono work to get paid work, they're using paid work to get more paid work. And you have two different bosses in those situations. I find that very troubling. Uh, and the final thing is, um, 
I was at the meeting, uh, both the committee of the whole meeting and the city council meeting, and I was very uh, concerned about some of the things that have not been answered about not just the Wiley Reber firm, but in general, the effectiveness and the need uh, for uh, the external investigators. So what I would like is for you to tell me where in the consent decree, where in the ordinance this is even author uh, authorized, and if it's not authorized, why in the world are we using them? We're in a situation as a CCPO that we wanted to have committees that would be under the purview, that would have to follow Maryland open meeting laws, and we were told we couldn't have them because they're not authorized in the ordinance. And now we're being told we're going to bring in for millions of dollars when we might have the capacity for it internally, uh, and there is no authorizing language. And I would also invite uh, Chief O'Hara to come up and answer some of these questions. And I would specifically, I like to ask Chief O'Hara, uh, was the PowerPoint that was presented tonight something that was reviewed with you? And two, are you at this meeting tonight because somebody uh, went back and told you about the motion that we passed in our last meeting requesting somebody from uh, MPD? Or was it as a result of the email that I put out and, and copied you on and uh, made sure that you knew that we had passed that motion? Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, commissioners, there were a myriad of questions there. So with respect to, to Jones Day, it really is pro bono. They, uh, we had a contract with Jones Day long ago um, for representation during the settlement agreement negotiations, but they exhausted that contract long ago and have been providing us truly free legal services since then, in including this investigation work. So. It, it truly is pro bono work. Uh, in terms of our ability to use outside investigators, the settlement agreement does talk about outside investigators. It also makes very, very clear that it's up to the city to determine uh, how to implement the terms of, of the settlement agreement. So we do need to clear the backlog, meet these uh, deadlines, and we are given the discretion in the settlement agreement to do so um, by, the, by the means that, that we um, deem necessary. And we have deemed it necessary um, to use outside uh, investigative services because of the size of the backlog. I think everybody can agree that we really need to, you know, to get justice for, for folks, we need to make our way through these investigations and the, the, we have deemed that the best way to do that is through outside investigative services. Um, in terms of Wiley-Reber, we did an RFP. Uh, they competed for the work. Um, we did not find that they have a conflict of interest. So um, they, they, they are the selected vendor to, to receive that, that contract. I'm going to um, speak to process. So in April of last year, there is an approved uh, standard operating procedures manual. Everyone is following that manual here whether they're an outside investigator or an inside investigator. They have to abide by the same policies that our internal investigators abide by. And outside help, in my humble opinion, I've been around government for about 30 years, is often used when you are behind. And we already are employing 22 22 internal investigators between IA and OPCR, when the backlog is caught up, we see in between 15 and 20 cases coming in to OPCR a month. Not all of those cases move forward, as you're probably well aware. They don't all have merit. And part of this is a balance between staffing and clearing a backlog. Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners, I just wanted to just tell you a little bit from my perspective where we're at um, and just kind of share that um, one of the things that's been talked about is um, justice for our citizens uh, and anyone that files a complaint in, in this circumstance I think is important. Uh, I think when you look at the settlement agreement, I think when you look at uh, the investigations by our uh, state human rights department or the DOJ, 
we're not moving fast enough. We need outside help to get up to speed to provide a good response for our residents. We have to do that. That will build trust. Just read the reports. Look at how long the investigations have taken. So I just say that it's important for us to get back in a place where there's trust with the community. There was a question about um, Chief O'Hara's appear, uh, appearance here um, and, and maybe also why uh, the other uh, officers in leadership are here. So I'll say this, um, I'm I think four months into the job. I don't know every single thing about what happens in MPD and certain policies and things like that. Um, I did ask Chief O'Hara to be present. Um, I wanted uh, Commander Ali to be present. He is that person in internal affairs uh, that gets those operations done. So um, I'm happy to have a Commander Wilkes here and, offer, and also, uh, um, also Gators as well. But I just say that their presence here is because of the importance of your work and being able for me to stand up here and not say, let me find out the answer and get back to you, that they would be able to be here to give you an answer that maybe I didn't know about so early uh, in my appointment here. So uh, I'll let um, Chief O'Hara talk about the comment about 20 uh, officers um, coming uh, into MPD, but just to know that he is working diligently across the board to get MPD in a good place, one, with officers and responses on, in all of his divisions. So I'll, I'll let Chief O'Hara talk. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair, uh, members of the commission. Um, I know there was a question about, uh, or comment about staffing of internal affairs. Um, that's what, I, I can talk about things internal to the police department. I can't speak for anything outside of the police department, but. I know when I got here, and um, the numbers in the presentation are a snapshot of what happens during the course of the year. I know when I got here, there were three investigators in internal affairs. The general standard um, for police internal affairs are one investigator for every 100 sworn members. So we increased that uh, almost immediately. Um, but the, the larger plan for IA is to have it be three uh, three components of internal affairs. One, uh, dealing with internal complaints, which is what we think of now as internal affairs. The second part that we're trying to break off, and that's the second lieutenant that you saw uh, mentioned in the presentation, we want to have a force investigations team as a component of IA so that everything uh, involving use of force by police, any uh, internal uh, complaint of excessive force, anything involving force at all, anything and everything, comes through that, uh, that group of investigators. And we're in the process of adding uh, civilian investigators to staff both of those components. So we'll have civilian investigators both in internal affairs and civilian investigators uh, you know, who will help review these cases uh, for for uh, for IA, the third component would be uh, just the folks who conduct background investigations for people who are coming on to the police department. Um, and I know uh, I think the only other thing concern, like the commissioner said, the commissioner had us directed to be here. I did get your email though. Thank you. Uh, and I know um, I think I ran into the vice chair at a gas station on West Broadway about a month ago, and she was already talking about this. So I knew this was coming, and, and uh, you know we're, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other commissioners with questions or comments? I just had a, oh, I'm sorry. Com Commissioner Shanfield. Thank you. I had two questions, and I'm not sure exactly who to direct them to. Um, but one is um, on slide 11 under the review panel on uh, the history. I think it's a slide that has 17 total cases that we've seen. Um, under the chief's decision, one question I've had for a while is, how long is the grievance period? And could you talk a little bit more about us, that for us to understand? Um, Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, that's an excellent question. So uh, I believe under the contract there's a 21-day period for um, the union to grieve discipline. 
um, and then you know steps of grievance after that. But once uh, a case is a appealed to arbitration, there's not actually a timeline that in the contract that that you know it's required to actually get to arbitration. Um, so uh, you know that there are certainly cases that are sort of have been appealed to arbitration and have not moved forward to the arbitration process. Thank you so much. Is there is it possible to look at numbers of things that are, 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 are can, awaiting? Can you move is closer it? to the mic? Is it possible to look at uh, at some point at numbers of cases that are currently in arbitration? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, I'm not sure that we have any that are actually scheduled for arbitration. My office actually does the arbitrations, and I'm not aware of us having any in the queue that are actually scheduled for ar arbitration, um, but I don't have the numbers of, of how many have been appealed to arbitration and are sort of waiting to get scheduled. Thank you. Vice Chair Reeves. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question is, well, my first comment is thank you for this presentation. Uh, we definitely need to hear this information. As I stated at last meeting, the dashboard was a concern. The backlog was a concern. So I really appreciate all this information. My question is, once a decision has been made by the chief, when will we hear that, if at all? So if it's not going through arbitration and it's done so that we have an idea of once the panels have been completed, something has happened. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, so there, there is summary data that you can be given, you know, sort of the way that the Data Practices Act works, um, particularly with the unionized workforce, is that once discipline is grieved, um, unless the grievance process is waived or unless we get through and actually win arbitration, those cases are not yet in final disposition. So we're not able to come back to you and say, you know, Off Officer Smith had this outcome. Um, until we actually reach the point of, of final disposition. But we can give you some summary data. Thank you. Commissioner Gurian Sherman. Thank you uh, to my fellow commissioners. That's the questions I was going to ask is can we get an, um, uh, uh, an addendum or a further part of the timeline that would include the 21 days, the arbitration. I'm assuming the arbitration goes through the Bureau of Mediation Services. And if that's the case, uh, my heart goes out to you. They have five, uh, they have a limited, they only have five mediators and they have a limited number of arbitrators. And so you kind of have to wait in line and there's no process. But if we could in the process timeline have an indication, even if it's a summary, uh, because what we're concerned about on the policy end of what we work on is we have to provide or we can provide recommendations for improving the process. The panels that we're sitting on, even if we have a three-year term, may not be resolved by the end of our three-year term. That's a problem, because then all that institutional knowledge that was talked about can't go forward. So I think we need to uh, really address that. And if we could just get that you know, included so that, especially as new commissioners come on, um, I do want to go back and say, I'm in, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, yes, we can provide that data, and yes, it, it is BMS, and, and in fact, um, if you all remember in 2021, there was some serious reform at the, at the state level, so that the, the discipline panels for law enforcement um, is through BMS, and it's a specialized group of folks who get specialized training on law enforcement cases, so, so it, it is a pretty limited number of folks who are certified to sit on those those law enforcement arbitration uh, panels, but um, we can absolutely give you some summary data. Thank you, that'd be great. And uh, this has been very, very helpful. Uh, I do wanna say I'm going into my 40th year as a, a, a lawyer in good standing. And I have to say, uh, the conflict of interest with Wiley Reber is very, very disturbing. Uh, to say that they don't have a conflict of interest in going through the process uh, when uh, Greg Wiley is the lead negotiator for the city on the Police Federation contract is baffling to me. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, in terms of the standard operating procedures that go all across OPCR and IA and these external investigators, when a case goes to IA, uh, the chief knows which investigators uh, going to be getting it. When it goes to OPCR, 
the director of OPCR and the civil rights director know. Uh, you, uh, uh, COO Anderson uh, Kelleher, know that as well. In fact, all the way up to the mayor, you could find out who is uh, tackling this. When it goes to an external investigator, we don't know if it's going to a first-year law clerk who doesn't know, you know, bupkis about police investigations, criminal law uh, at all, or if it's going to a contract attorney. We don't know if they're getting the 16 hours of training that's required because the SOPs were designed for internal staff. So I appreciate that you have the discretion for that. It doesn't mean that it's effective. My other concern is, is it in fact, even though they did 23 cases, is it in fact reducing the caseload uh, fast enough, or is it in fact burdening uh, other staff in IA and OPCR because they have to provide extra support to them? So you're paying uh, for this, uh, this, even with Jones Day, you're paying for it because we have staff that have to be involved. I have yet to see anything that shows it's effective. And yes, we need to clear up the backlog. But one of the things the consent decree talks about over and over again is fairness. And fairness isn't done quickly. It's done by quality. And my concern is you have officers, uh, if it's not done well, who could have uh, uh, something on their record that they don't deserve. And we also have the public that simply does not trust us. We've had upheaval in the last uh, uh, two weeks. Uh, you know, terminations, uh, departures, two commissioners uh, who were valued, who have left. And the public is saying, we've been here before. And so if you can't show why it is these external investigators are actually do they did those 23 cases and they went through an internal process to show that they were as effective as if we could do it internally, I'm not convinced. And I think that's a, a, something that other members of the public may not be either. So Madam Chair, if I could, one of the things, and this has been an often talked about thing in the last few weeks, is one of the reasons the embedded attorney exists in this process is to make sure these cases are as well done and as strong as possible to withstand that arbitration process. That is true for our internal investigators and it is true for the pro bono assistance. And my understanding is I have asked people to review those 23 cases and they were done in a high quality manner. I think we need to understand the reason we have an embedded attorney from our city attorney's office is to provide that guidance and oversight to have the strong cases. So I know I am not having a debate with you, Madam Commissioner, <laughs> at all, but I do want to say there are processes in place to be able to have that oversight and make sure those cases are well done and strong. Thank I you. I appreciate that. I just want to say that clear this notion of the embedded attorney, the external investigators, was clearly a point of, connect, a point uh, of contention, contention. Yeah. with Director Gillespie and Director Jefferson. And I don't think we can sit there and ignore it just because I'm we sorry. can't talk about it's, why they were excuse fired. Me. We, you put it in your very me, memo. Commissioner. So I think that's a point that we need we, to address. And we have a point of order about. that needs to you be can addressed. You cut me off as much as you want. We have a point of order that needs to be addressed. We are going to follow some sort of civil procedure here, and that's part of it. Who made a point of that order? That was me, uh, Commissioner Shanfield. Thank I'm you. I'm just wondering if you have a question. If not, I think we should move to the next, because we've still got a lot in the agenda to co cover. And I also find that point of order well taken. Is there a question? No, but you asked for comments, so I Thank made a you. comment. And, and you have, have made you've had sufficient time to make comments but I will ask if you have further comments that we could present them in a written form and allow other commissioners who have questions and comments to speak at this time in an interest of time who do the written comments uh, questions go to you or the uh you can write an email you can send it to me you can send it to I mean Basically, you can choose who you can. Madam Chair, it Thank probably you. would be better form to circulate any communications from the body through you as chair so that we can Thank have you. control of that. Thank you. It can be circulated through me. Uh, Commissioner Newman. 
Hello, good day. Um, thank you for that. Um, just kind of looking at the cases on the intake log and just thinking of it, you know, the ones from the OPCR, you know, the IA, as well as what's on the legacy system, and just thinking kind of what I've seen recently in the news about the number of officers that we actually have on the force. Um, so these cases, are these multiple cases amongst particular individual officers, or are these just individual officers? Because my concern is if there is an officer that is within this intake numbers and another infraction comes within this time frame, what in our, your new system, the legacy system, what are the practices right now to be able to look at, say this officer has a case on file and now we have a brand new one, can we fast track this any particular way? You know, how is this, you know, come forth to bring things to light, or is it just a brand new case, it's a new number, and it's gonna be another 449 days backlog, you know, you know, just trying to understand that piece. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carolina Amini, the Interim Director for OPCR. I can answer on behalf of OPCR. Um, yes, that is the case. There are cases that could have one officer or multiple officers, and depending on the, the status of that, of that officer, could be routed in different ways, and if, uh, if there are changes in status, uh, say if one is on leave, one leaves and one stays, we would then focus accordingly on on that officer and manage the timeline that way. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Commander Ali with the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, in addition to her comments, we also utilize EIS. Nick is here. So when we have officers that violate another allegation of the Minneapolis Police Department's policies and procedure, we refer them to EIS as well so Thank you. and he'll speak on EIS management good evening commissioners uh, chair thanks for having me um, yes we are currently work oh sorry uh, Nick Barkley I work for the police department at the main or work for the Minneapolis Police Department in the early intervention um, as director Amini and uh, commander Ali had said um, we're working in earnest now to coordinate um, any duplicative um, officers who have been um, identified as focus officers in the complaint process um, that will be referred to early intervention system and we'll be tracking that data as well um, if you recall in November I prevented, provided a presentation to this body regarding what early intervention system is and how it's intended to operate moving forward um, as of this week actually um, we've been given the directive by director Amini to facilitate that work um, in earnest so I'll be working with OPCR staff to get that uh, up and going Thank you. Oh. Also to uh, address the second part, if there is an officer in a current administrative investigation and a new complaint comes in as part of our policy that uh, the intake investigators then run a search to see if there are any existing cases within with that officer within a given time period, if there were any other uh, just cases in general, which can then expedite and uh, alter the course of that new case if there is a new case that comes in as well. Thank you. Are there further questions? Okay, thank you everyone. And without more questions, oh, you're just agreeing. No, I'm okay. just, thank you. Thank you, um, and without objection, I'll uh, direct the clerk to receive and file your reports and have them added to the file for pu public access uh, in LIMS. And the final item under the chair's report is an update from the city clerk on the status of anticipated vacancies and the open appointments timeline. So I'll recognize Mr. Carl for that brief report. Thank you, Madam Chair. For all commissioners, hopefully in your stapled packet, uh, immediately following the first time I presented on CCPO calendar of 2024 meeting dates, the next page should be a memo from me to this body discussing CCPO terms and vacancies. I know that the executive staff covered in their last slide some of this information about uh, upcoming vacancies. You can see on my slide here or my page that there are a total of seven seats, numbers 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, 13, and 15. Uh, these were the initial seats that we drew out of a hat when we created this body to stagger terms. So when we create any board or any commission, uh, we 
put all the numbers of those seats into a hat, randomly draw them so that we can stagger appointments going forward. These are the seats that were chosen to have an initial one-year appointment. The other seats not listed here have a two-year initial appointment. Uh, at the expiration, all appointments going forward be a standard three-year term. So these terms, as you can see, end May 31st of this year. It talks about which of the ward representations those seats are tied to. Uh, our open appointments process for the spring cycle opened March 1st. It will run the entire month through March 31st. There's an online application form that you can access through our city website. If you need assistance with that, please let my office know. We're happy to help. Um, terms, as I said, for the new term for these seats would be three years, which would begin then on June 1st of this year and would run through May 31st of 2027. So the next term would be a full term, full three-year term, June tw uh, 1st of 2024 through May 31st. I will also point out, and I know everyone here is aware, that in addition to the seven seats I've listed, uh, Commissioner Awed from uh, the Ward 6 representative had resigned his position. We will be adding that as an additional recruitment. That brings it to a total of eight vacancies uh, that are anticipated or known right now. I will point out that the Ward 6 seat will be a different appointment. We'll be looking to appoint for the remainder of the unexpired term. So for that seat, it will be a one-year appointment through the end of the normal official term, which would be through May of next year. And then that seat would also be up for a full three-year term. So I think I've explained that process. There is a memo in your briefing packet. If there's questions, Madam Chair, I'm happy to respond to them. But I would uh, close by just saying, if there are questions, concerns, or need of assistance, specifically for those seats that are up for appointment now, please contact my office. We're happy to help you through that process. Thank you. Are there any, thank you for explaining the unexpired seat term and all that. It, I, I know it can get a little confusing. Are there any questions about the open, Commissioner Gurry and Sherman? So I just want to be clear that when somebody reapplies, they will have served for four years if they go to the end of their three-year term, right? The one year plus the three. Uh, through the chair, yes, that is correct. And uh, is there uh, any requirement that a council member, if they're the one appointing, has to appoint somebody that lives or works in the ward? Is, or could you explain the residency requirement? Certainly. Uh, Madam Chair, I heard two questions, and then the first one I want to clarify uh, maybe wasn't a question. That is the council appointing or council member. And I want to clarify. Thank council you. members nominate. They don't appoint. All appointments are official acts of both the mayor and the council. So an appointment takes that action. It's a nomination by the council or the mayor. So where it says appointing authority on this uh, sheet, for example, it'll say council, and then there's a seat for the mayor. Um, that's an, a hangover. The correct terminology we should be using is those are the uh, authorities who make nominations. To make the appointment takes an official action, a vote of the majority of council and the approval of the mayor, regardless of which seat we're talking about. Um, then I would go on to say, in terms of representation, the ordinance does not require the, the selected nominee, if you will, who is up for appointment, to live within the ward. Um, the ward representative means the, the member of the council who is making a nomination. So, for example, the Ward 6 nominee is coming from the Ward 6 council member. It doesn't mean that nominee needs to live in Ward 6, per se. That's very helpful. There's nothing in the ordinance itself, the CCP ordinance, that authorizes reapplying for a position. Is there other ordinances that authorize people to reapply for the positions? Madam Chair, perhaps I can ask that question to be restated differently. I know of nothing in the CCPO enabling legislation, the ordinance creating this body, that requires or would prohibit members who are currently serving from putting forward a, an application to be reappointed. Thank you. Thank you. Are there additional questions for the city clerk? Okay. Thank you. And there is no further action required, so I'll ask the clerk to receive and file his report. With that, we've completed all the items under the chair's report. The next order of business is reports, and we'll begin with a report from the Office of Police Conduct Review presented by our interim director, Ms. Amini. And we 
FYI, have allocated 15 minutes for this report. As Ms. Amini comes to the microphone, I'll also point out all members should have a copy of her printed report at your desks. If not, please let me know. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And I do want to apologize for the late notice for this report. Um, I want to emphasize I did start on Wednesday and I have a few things to, to get in order here so that that will not happen again and I, I strongly uh, apologize. And before I read this report, I also want to mention um, the OPCR staff. Uh, they welcome me with open arms. They are a wonderful group. They are ready to work and they, they come every day excited and, and they just want to get the job done. They want to do good work and I think that they're, they're doing that. And I just, uh, I just want uh, everyone to know that the OPCR staff is, you know, many of them are here and uh, they don't get enough recognition and, and I'm here to, to voice that. Um, so I, I will read some of this out loud, um, uh, considering the, the late notice for, for the report. Um, so for hiring, we, we do have those three positions that we are seeking to fill. Uh, that is something that is on my priority list to move forward. Um, and then, of course, uh, me being uh, the interim director uh, starting March 6th, which is last Wednesday. Uh, in regards to the website, OPCR-related uh, web pages for the City of Minneapolis website have been undergoing some month-long changes to uh, update with the settlement agreement, and those updates have... Uh, been approved by me and they are working on getting that update uh, started with the website. Uh, the external dashboards will also be updated in the following weeks and they'll continue to approve as the data team expands the data capabilities. We do have um, uh, a legal analyst available and he's been working tirelessly with IT and with MPD to get all of that data through uh, the the programs that we use and uh, along with the two record management systems that the data is being flown through. Uh, and then part of those changes is replacing the outdated information within the websites and also working with the Unity Community Mediation Team to add those community site information to the website. And that is also uh, towards the back of this document that has the, the locations and their contact information for the community if they so choose to submit a complaint using uh, UMCT. Uh, for intake, um, intake has been slow. Uh, the intake team, however, has continued to, to work on those cases and many are now in supervisory review. Uh, we have been working hours today trying to get to uh, a review of those cases and move those cases forward. Um, Additionally, the city attorney's office with their embedded attorneys reviewing those intake cases alongside us. And the introduction to the step has created some new timelines that we need to uh, problem solve and, and adjust accordingly uh, to eliminate some of those delays that we have with our streamlining. Um, we do have two cases that went through the full intake in OPCR that will now change because of the meetings that we had today. Uh, one case was dismissed and then another one is routed internally as a preliminary investigation. And then 11 complaints were filed within the month of February to OPCR. And then there were, there were 32 cases that are in supervisory review, which includes all cases being reviewed by intake uh, supervisor, the embedded attorney, and the OPCR director. And those cases were reviewed today. Uh, intake highlights, uh, they were working on developing policies and procedures for expedited dispositions as allowed uh, by the MDHR settlement agreement. And then for the investigation, the investigation teams are currently split between two units, one within the legacy uh, records management system, which some have uh, referred to as practice manager, and then also another team with Axon standards which is the new records management system that I, you know, PCR have, uh, have started using since February of 23. Um, so we are preparing those cases to also give uh, to the external investigator contracted by the city. And then we are also continuing the training for the new investigator, investigators. And then we are going to develop a list of cases that will be referred to the new in external investigator contracted. Uh, and then there are seven cases in the final supervisor review 
Uh, they will be approved by me. They, I have all those cases with me, um, and they will be reviewed expeditiously. Uh, once that is prepared and uh, recommendations and resubmitted by uh, the investigators, that will then be scheduled to panel. And then uh, we will work on uh, scheduling those panels shortly. And then for data and research, um, we have two OPCR staff, including the legal analyst and the program assistant. And that team had spent about 95 hours responding to 50 data requests in February alone. Uh, and then the review panels, uh, in February, there was one police conduct review panel that was held, which was remanded. Uh, three cases were sent to MPD's uh, chief for disciplinary decisions. And the last two cases from January panels and one remanded case that was reviewed in February. And then there are no cases that are pending for CCPO review currently. So those seven will then move to the CCPO review once uh, the review is done. Um, and then final MPD uh, chief's decision, the chief found no merit on five cases. <clears throat> that decision agreed with the majority vote of the panel, which reviewed those cases, and the chief found merit in one case. That decision was agreed with the majority vote of panel, which reviewed the, the case. And then that final disciplinary uh, decision is published online, and there's the link in the document. And then for review panel highlights, there are currently no completed investigations uh, to be reviewed by the review panel, as, as I had mentioned earlier. And then we have the OPCR updated uh, the instruction sheets to match the new panel recommendation forms. And then OPCR, City Attorney's Office, and MPD are working to streamline the notification process for disciplinary decisions. And then lastly, the UCMT. Uh, OPCR continues to maintain contact with UCMT. Uh, they do have additional sites to assist with complaint filing, and, and those locations are listed below, um, where complainants can then get more information on their time slots and get appointments with them if necessary to uh, attend those locations. Uh, UCMT is in direct con uh, contact with ALIFA, the independent evaluator chosen, the, uh, chosen to monitor the MDHR settlement agreement, and they wish to connect with Minneapolis communities and learn about their concerns. So with that, I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Amini. Are there any questions for our interim director, Vice Chair Reeves? Thank you, Ms. Amidi. I really appreciate you uh, being here and doing this on such short notice, and it's just a few days that you've been doing this job, so thank you. I would ask, though, that when you provide your report monthly to us, that you include the date that the data was taken out of the system. What we found is the data doesn't match when we get the report, and so if you could just put a date so we'll know if we're looking at it two days ago, that morning, or whatever it is, so that we can accurately line up the numbers that we're talking about. The community has a vested interest in the backlog and cases that we're working on, and we want it to be as accurate as possible. So if you could provide the date in which you pull that data, it'd be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Gary and Sherman. Thank you for the report. We appreciate it. We can understand why it was late. Um, we've been late on things, too. Um, uh, I want to just say that there were several questions, I think three or four or five or six, I don't remember, but they're in the February 12th minutes that didn't get addressed in the OPCR report, and if you could answer those questions, they're right in the minutes. We don't need them this meeting, but if you could include them in your report for April, that would be helpful. Um, uh, uh, second, um, we're now down to commissioners. Uh, so that's, you know, as, as cases get ready for review panels. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this or if it has to go to a higher level. Uh, when I was reviewing the ordinance today, I, I came across what I think is a contradictory part of the ordinance. At one point it says all members of the commission must serve as review panelists uh, pursuant to 172.40 as assigned by the director of civil rights or the director's designate, which would be you. But another part, uh, talking about fingerprinting, uh, basically says that um, every, uh, all of us have gone through background checks, and um, if a member doesn't pass the background check, then they can't serve on a panel. So how can you have that all the commission members must serve as panelists, but then um, there are some who 
uh, don't pass the background check and can't be. And then it says 10 members of the commission. There must be at all times at least 10 members of the commission who have passed the required background test. Uh, for me, that's concerning because then that means that there are, it's more for the 10 people. So I'm just wondering how that, and, and, and I appreciate uh, the city attorney coming up. I don't know if that, if I'm reading that wrong, uh, but I'm concerned that we're down two. And uh, I'm assuming there's been no problems with background checks and that we're all, uh, <laughs> we're all passing that and we're all been able to serve. So I'm really looking you know, towards the future. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioners, so the, essentially the reason for the background check is that some of the cases, not all of the cases, but some of the cases involve um, data from the criminal justice information system, the federal system, and in order to access that data, even if it's not directly in the system, but even copies of that data, um, a, a person needs to be um, ba backgrounded and pass a background check. So uh, that's why that ordinance is written, so that it requires at least 10 members to be fully backgrounded so, so that there's enough folks to, to always be able to review cases that have CGIS data. Not every case necessarily has CGIS data. So if there were ever a situation where um, a, a commissioner didn't pass a background check, it wouldn't completely preclude them from being part of a review panel. We would just have to be very careful that it's not a, a case that has CGIS data involved. I see. So it's CGIS that controls it. There's no discretion that's given to like the mayor to say this person has been an exemplary citizen and we, uh, we would like to uh, ask for dispensation so that they can serve. Uh, it, Madam Chair, Commissioners, I mean, it, essentially that's true. I think that maybe there's some sort of waiver process that you can go through with the federal government, but you're at their mercy. So, so you know, it's it, essentially it's a federal requirement and, and we, don't, we don't have discretion about it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions for our interim director? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll direct the clerk to receive and file that report. Next, we have a report on the community input sessions focused on the police department's policies and procedures. That report will be presented by Commander Yolanda Wilkes, who I do not see in here anymore. Madam Chair, yes. we can try and check the overflow room. I noticed that many of the officers uh, stepped out of the room, yeah. um, and perhaps they've yeah. stepped out for a moment. I, I don't know, but uh, we'll check and let you know. Thank you very much. Well, as we... And, and maybe while you're doing that, I hog the microphone for one oh, more minute. Go for um, it. Uh, unfortunately, I moved the sign-in registration forms for public comments, so I might just take this opportunity to say if there are members of the public who were going to sign up to speak during the public comment portion of tonight's meeting, that sign-up sheet is right up here by me near the dais. I know that in the past the staff had put that on the long table, so to avoid any confusion, the sign-up sheet for members of the public who wanted to speak during the uh, public comment period of tonight's meeting that sign-up sheet is right here. There are also uh, comment sheets, so if people wish to fill out a written form to have their comments incorporated in the record and not actually testify, there are also comment sheets that are available here uh, near the clerk station at the dais. Thank you. Thank you for that. And unless there are any objections, I'd like to um, just move along on the agenda, and we will stop uh, when Commander Wilkes comes in. But we do have just some brief, we're going to have a, uh, some, a series of reports from our work groups that are listed on the agenda. And I'll, I'll note that we don't have a report this evening from our community engagement group, but they do may have some information to share um, at any rate. So we'll first hear from the Police Policy Research and Recommendations Work Group, and then the Governance Work Group, and then the Community Engagement Work Group in that order. Madam Chair, thank you so much. Like Madam Chair, thank you so much. We had, uh, I am, I'm the Commissioner Shamfield, the Chair of the policy, Police Policy Research and Recommendations Group. We had a productive meeting on uh, February 22nd, 
uh, present were Commissioners Lohr, Olson, uh, Vice Chair Reeves, uh, Commissioner Sturm, and Commissioner William Johnson. Absent was Commissioner Gurry and Sherman. And we had a chance to uh, review the, the policies in Baltimore and Albuquerque, uh, added on to what we have already looked at in Cleveland and New Orleans. And we're just trying to do our homework so that we can uh, be, become more knowledgeable about cities under consent decrees and what they uh, have done in their, how they have changed their policies. We also looked at the January special order issued by uh, uh, Chief O'Hara on use of special force uh, reporting. And next, we are going to, I'm excited to hear from Commander Wilkes about the implementation reports because we were going to go uh, and, and read those very deeply. We still will do that, but it'll be great to hear uh, an overview um, and, and her perspective as well. Uh, we are looking forward to further direction on our charge with reviewing policy, the timeline for that, when is appropriate to do that, how we can cooperate uh, with, the, with the monitor as well as uh, with, with MDHR. And we'd also love some more information at some point on IA's approach to assigning allegations based on the policy violations. That's something we don't understand how it happens, and it would help us in the case investigation. So, thank you. Thank you. Are there any quick questions, comments for the police policy research and recommendations work group? I'd like to just comment. Thank you for uh, the, the report and the work. I'm sorry I couldn't make the last meeting. We had a virtual forum with Minneapolis for Better Police Conflict Contract that had been scheduled, and so I wasn't able to make it. I look forward to getting to the next committee meeting. Okay, thank you. Let's move to the um, governance, well, yes, governance work group. Thank you, Commissioner Olson. Um, taking the lead in the, the governance, governance group. We have two projects uh, that are underway, one a revision of the bylaws, the other a revision of the uh, review of the CCPO ordinance. Both are in under review at this point. We have a second draft of the bylaws that, that the working group um, is reviewing. We have um, the, the ordinances before, uh, before the city attorney's office, the city clerk's office, and other um, city entities that are helping us out, um, I will um, take it upon myself to try and nudge those things forward before the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions about the governance work group report? Okay, hearing none, let's move on to the community engagement. Work group report. Madam Chair, Commissioner Smith, um, the uh, community engagement work group had a meeting last Thursday, and so our timing didn't coincide with getting a report in. I hope all the commissioners received an email from me uh, summarizing the report of our, our group. Um, we had a detailed discussion of a planning for a May public hearing in which we would devote about two hours of time for extensive public comment after a brief presentation about the charge of the commission and our work to date and our work plan. Um, we also had discussion about uh, several options for further community outreach uh, after the May meeting. Uh, one of those would be uh, a ward-based approach in which we would uh, provide uh, support for each uh, commissioner to, uh, in the ward they represent, uh, have uh, some kind of gathering, perhaps connecting with an established neighborhood meeting that is um, uh, uh, well known. Um, we, we also uh, had the idea that if for any reason that uh, we don't see the capacity for that, uh, that another option would be to uh, plan and program for at least four listening sessions out in different sectors of the community. Um, we are mindful of not duplicating the work uh, of community outreach that is being done in this sphere in, in other areas, and so we want to see uh, continued alignment. We had some discussion and review of the uh, listening sessions, community input sessions that the MPD has held that were to hear about maybe this evening. Um, and then we also explored the idea of 
uh, and we'll bring more back on this, but the idea of just one-on-one -one outreach in which each commissioner would endeavor to meet on a fairly regular basis with one or two new people in the community that are known to care about our work and uh, bring back and, and share that information. Um, uh, and we noted uh, MPD ride-alongs as another means of outreach. So um, we briefly discussed the priorities resolution that uh, is in the packet, and that was our meeting. Thank you very much. As, are there any questions regarding this, Commissioner Gurry and Sherman? Uh, it dawned on me during the presentation from Alifa that uh, we might want to have our next community engagement meeting with uh, some of you folks from Alifa uh, to gain to get an answer to your question about what do we do to get engagement. Uh, we have a, a plan for having community engagement in May uh, instead of doing a whole meeting. Um, and I'm just hoping that we could reach out to you and see if we can uh, try to join forces on that and also on these uh, smaller community meetings and one-on-one -on -one and just benefit from your expertise. It is a mandate that we have to have one public meeting a year, and uh, uh, we can get you the ordinance that shows the commitment to uh, uh, community engagement. It's not only in the consent decree, it's actually in the CCPO ordinance. Thank you. Um, I do want to note that, and I failed to mention this earlier, that the uh, two written reports that were submitted, the Governance Work Group and the Police, Pri Police Policy Research and Recommendations reports, are available on the agenda and, um, online, and you can just click on them and those reports will open. Um, and our final discussion tonight, I don't um, is about the draft of the 2024 CCPO work policies. Did the governance work group or the police policy research and recommendation work group want to say anything about that draft resolution um, at this time? I hate to just say no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just feel a little uh, caught off guard. I wasn't Okay. prepared for that oh it's not the, okay just offering the opportunity okay thank you we agreed that we would all provide individual comments to commissioner olson over email so okay. that we didn't take up any more time thank you so much and so that concludes the work group reports and i have yes madam chair i'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news um due to some miscommunication that i'll take ownership of uh, commander wilkes from the minneapolis police department who was slated to give a presentation had some personal obligations and i think due to the length of the meeting we knew this was going to be a, a rather lengthy meeting she had to leave um, and uh, attempted to give me a, a, a heads up to that I, I failed to get that in time so with the body's permission i think we could probably move that to the next meeting and um, take responsibility for maybe moving that up earlier on the agenda so we make sure to get her uh, report uh, at the next meeting and again my apologies for missing that but she did have some personal commitments that she had to get to tonight okay thank you and i i Yes, we will add her to the, what is next month? The April agenda and move her up a little further. Thank you. Um, because I think we were all looking forward to hearing um, from her. Okay, our next order of business is new business. And I um, was not alerted to any potential items of new business prior to the agenda being adopted, but I'll check to see if there are any items to address tonight from commissioners. Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move to public comment. Oh, oh, thank you. We'll take comments in the order that speakers have registered. If you wish to address the commission tonight and haven't already done so, you may register with the clerks at the side um, of the dais. And each speaker, as usual, will be given two minutes to address the commission tonight. And we have a timer the big two minutes flashing over there um, to assist speakers in monitoring their use of time. If you have any materials to be included in the public record of this meeting, please give that to the clerks. And with that, our first speaker tonight is 
H. Dotson. I apologize, I cannot read. Howard Dotson. Is this, is this a violate the quorum if I? I, okay? I don't have a problem with your poster. But, but if you could please speak into the mic yeah. so we can all hear you. I just could put it on the chair. Okay. My name is Howard Dotson, I live in Ward 5. Thank you for having public comment. My journey began with my uncle being a sergeant with MPD. My other uncle was a firefighter. I've served as a chaplain for four police departments over 15 years. I was at Grace Church after the Burnsville tragedy. So I ask that we pray for our officers. That's why I have a back our blue. We're down 300 officers. All that take the option to retire will be down 400 officers. The city council declined to give the 19 million in hiring and retention bonuses. What happens when these officers work so much overtime and they don't take care of themselves? They're very vulnerable to excessive use of force. So I urge you to remember the heart beneath the badge and to advocate for Chief O'Hara to be able to get the officers he needs to keep our community safe. We have a <clears throat> settlement or legal agreement because people sued because they were not getting the service they need to feel safe. The response times, we had an overdose at the 4th Street. It took 20 minutes. When you OD, you have six minutes. That's the reality of what's out there right now. So I'm just advocating that we support our officers and get the righteous ones. If you're a Derek Chauvin wannabe, I'll show you the door. But we gotta lift up the righteous ones and have times of coming together and breaking bread. Houses of worship, invite the first responders. Have a barbecue, get to know the officers. I ask that you pray every day for Blue, and when you see an officer, give him a fist bump and say, I prayed for Blue today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dotson. Next on the list is Andrew. I was looking at the numbers you guys provided in the slideshow, and it jumped out to me that in 2022, OPCR with a staff of 12 people, including five investigators, was 1.3 million full budget, not just wages and salaries. That's what's gonna be given to Wiley Reed. Now, it's possible that there is not a conflict of interest. I'm not a lawyer, I can't answer that. But when you have the group who is negotiating the police contract, also then assigned to investigate police misconduct, there is an appearance of conflict of interest. And if you're trying to build community trust, I don't think that moves it in, that, in the direction of trust. So just something to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we have Dave Bicking. Hi, um, Dave Bicking, Ward 8. Also wanted to talk about Wiley Reber, um, that uh, I generally uh, support what the Commissioner uh, Gorian Sherman said about external investigators. I know the, um, that's still in the process of uh, getting that contract. The Civil Rights Department seems to be happy with that law firm. One of the, I've looked at their website. One of their areas of practice on the website is civil rights. That sounds good, doesn't it? But in any civil rights case, there are attorneys on both sides. Um, from the um, uh, Wiley Reber uh, website, um, it turns out they always and only defend against civil rights claims. It seems inappropriate for the Civil Rights Department to be contracting with a law firm that is consistently opposed to civil rights. Also, another inconsistency, I went to the last uh, Civil Rights Commission meeting and they had their, their um, orientation. And um, 
As part of that, the open meeting law was covered, as it should be. I have a few slides here, and it says, you know, meetings have to be open. What groups are covered? The full Civil Rights Commission, the standing committees, and the task forces. Now, you have working groups which operate very much like standing committees, but there is certainly more important to have open meetings of those than there are of a task force which has one um, generally topic and ends when that happens. The work groups are much more like standing committees. Why is there this inconsistency in the open meeting law within the Civil Rights Department? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jan, and you will have to tell us your last name. I apologize. Nye. Uh, Nye. Thank you. We have Jan Nye next. Hmm. Well, I'm happy to say that individual liability for police officers has been introduced to the city, Minneapolis City Council by Robin Wansley and has been voted on and approved by a majority of the council to be sent on for further scrutiny. This proposal is the epitome of fairness, um, of individual integrity, and like and the pride of those who tr <clears throat> truly protect and serve. It doesn't depend on anything but personal responsibility and the principle of equality um, of our country, uh, that our country uh, prides itself on. Uh, if an officer becomes too expensive, he or she becomes uninsurable and not employable by the MPD. Simple. So, um, <laughs> I guess that's pretty much what I have to say. Okay. Uh, I think it would be a great and simple way of employing dependable and honest and hardworking officers. And I know there are, there are many of them out there, but the other ones kind of ruin it for, for the good officers. So I'm rooting for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have James Riley. James Riley. I'll ask you to speak into the mic so that. It, oh, sure. Thank you. Madam Commissioner and co fellow commissioners, uh, my name is James Riley, Ward 1. Um, a couple points. I couldn't find the CCPO meeting dates in the documentation provided. I, I thought I heard that it was in that documentation. Um, also, uh, uh, I, in hearing about the conflict, um, wondering if the city attorney's office could provide commissioners with a definition of what the conflict of interest is, uh, or, or what a conflict of interest is. Um, and a third point, I'm, I'm a uh, volunteer member of Communities United Against Police Brutality, a mental health work group. And I guess I'd like to uh, know more about how mental health crisis calls are transitioned from the county to the city, and if it's possible that an audit could be done, like annually, to see if those calls are um, handled appropriately. Um, because if there's like a co-response with Minneapolis, I want to know how that works. Right now, it looks like it's the county. There's only four public safety answering points as of what I found on the website, uh, Minnesota uh, Public uh, Safety Answering Point Directory. Um, and those would be Hennepin County dispatched. And I'm not sure how it works between the police department. And it'd be nice to know how um, those calls are handled. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And the last, the final name on our list uh, for public comment is Sarah Silva. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Sarah Silva and I'm here not through my job, but as a concerned community member. I live in Ward 5 and I'm here to talk about uh, the North Star Act, which is a bill that we're presenting, uh, we're trying to present this legislative uh, session, uh, Senate, excuse me, um, in the Senate it's SF3516 and in the House it's 3459. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because this bill is important to a lot of our immigrant community. Um, it's a, it's actually what you guys are already doing here. We just need it to expand it to provide safety for all of our community in Minnesota. Um, so as a survivor of domestic violence, it's been a vicious cycle throughout my life. It's continued through my adulthood. And I would like to know that the police department could be behind us. Um, anyone going through domestic violence, um, you know, BIPOC individuals, LGBTQ members in our community, anyone and everyone, it is really hard to call the cops. I myself am a DACA recipient, and I cannot call the cops. I think about it four times, maybe five, before I can even think about calling. And I've stood there and I've watched domestic violence happen throughout my whole life because no one in my family will call. Because that, what that means for us is that our children can get taken away. They won't have anyone even though they're US citizens. And we need to protect the smallest of Minnesotans. And I am just so tired of deciding whether I need to call because of the responsibility that I will endure is inheriting many kids. And I just ask you to please connect with your police department so they could support this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark, did we receive any additional sign-ins? No. no, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We've completed all public comments for tonight. And with that, we've completed all items on our agenda. I want to express my deep and sincere appreciation to my fellow commissioners for your thoughtful discussion tonight, to the city's administration, to the mayor's cabinet of executive officers, to our interim OPCR director, Ms. Amini, and to all of the staff for their support in preparing for tonight's meeting and for this reset with the Oversight Commission. The commission's next meeting is scheduled for Monday, April 15 at 6 p.m. in this chamber. And with that and without any objections, this commission stands adjourned. Good evening. <laughs>